One of the first things I'd like to do is uh, thank all our sponsors that helped us put together and provide input and money uh, for today's event. And I'm going to just read through the list. Um, South Dakota Wheat Commission, Farm Credit Services of America, Wheat Growers, Mustang Seed, Monsanto, Prairie State Seeds, Next Level Ag LLC, Millborn Seeds, Lacrosse Seeds, Dakota Best Seed, Agronomy Plus, Farmers Alliance, Mitchell, First Dakota National Bank, c and Operations in Davidson County Implement, Scott Supply, Crop Tech, Ducks Unlimited, Aurora County Conservation District, Davidson County Conservation District, Hanson County Conservation District, uh, South Dakota No-Till Association, SDSU Extension, USDA and NRCS, and Pioneer Hybrids of DuPont. So let's give them all a welcome round of applause. Corey Cronin, Casey Cronin, and we're seeing such a big value in bringing livestock into our farming operation because it was uh, a few years ago we decided that wasn't the thing we should do and now uh, we're gonna, excuse me if you guys can't see, but you know that Casey and I are gonna kind of tag team this, but you know, and see the date on the bottom, 2007. So we've been grazing cover since 2007. The more we learn, the more questions we have. We're trying to put sense to this in dollars wise because that's what we really feel we have to do. You can say whatever you want to do, but it still comes down to the amount to dollars. They said, they said on the Leopold Award, you guys, and, and you know, besides Janet, because she's a young one, but just look at right here, cut this in half, and look at the age of these people right here. Everybody on our farm understands soil health, what we need to do to make soil health, and when we talk, we talk a lot of carbon, we talk a lot of soil health. Because soil health is a driving force, and if a person doesn't think it is, if we keep doing what we're doing the next 10 years, we're going to, every year we, we see it. So soil health is, a, is a, really a driving force. Casey's going to, or Corey, Casey. No, we've we got about 775 cows, cow calves that we calve out every year. Uh, we run on about 8,500 acres, mostly along the the river here and pastures and then we we take them back up to the farm in the winter time and that's where we do all our cover crop grazing corn stalks get out on the fields so um, this slide thought was pretty interesting this is I, I didn't ever understand that well why can't we just mow this pasture off what's the big deal with that I mean it's there it's growing well this pretty much explains it once I got used to that to where if you are leaving something you're going to have a lot more to graze later on. You know and I and, and I really appreciate what Casey and Corey are doing and not saying Bonnie wasn't there also but they're really understanding the the divide fences and the moving and different water systems and so but I mean that I just think that's something you guys you don't think about that but just think I mean that's and this is something that, you know, you can't put a f value on. This is Casey and Wiley. You cannot put a value on what, the, what Casey's doing to build for the future because that's what we have to do. You know, but the one thing is, is uh, so there's three generations of building a lasting legacy. So on our farm, we want everybody to understand what's going on. We want to understand why we're doing this. We're not doing this just because it's, it it's, doesn't cost as much or whatever. We understand and we're all building soil health. You know, one thing we talk about rain and everybody gets, everybody talks about, well, yeah, you got this rain, we got this rain. And so, you know, 19 inches is our norm. But so we, th these are our pivots down here. So in, in May, June, and July, we had half as much rain as what we normally do in the last 30 years. So you need the soil health, you need to have the, the good growth, you need to capture every bit of water you can do. And that's where our pivots come in. 
because it used, we used to be corn bean guys and we found out where that really isn't what we should do. And then another thing, and we will protect our resource. We, we farm, we ranch up along this river and we are gonna protect that resource. So these are some of the rotations, but this is the neatest thing about the rotations is any time we can, we come back with a cover. We come back with the cover and we come back with that cover, it's a grazing cover. Casey. So this is just Casey. kind of. Yeah, there's a pointer. Oh, okay. His is green. Oh, okay. So we can tell each other apart. <laughs> we can duel here. So this is one of the, the circles down on the river up above. Uh, we planted peas on it, combined the peas, then went in with a, with a six-way mix, like it says there. Um, we luckily had the, the pivot on it, and we watered it up, and then we ran, ran our cows on it for a couple weeks, and then after that we turned in, we fence line weaned our calves, which we really like, and they were, well, we turned the cows in there, cows were on the other, or calves were on the other side of it, and the cows just went to eating, and everybody just kind of weaned themselves. After that, we harvested the lower circles, the cows went down on that, we put the calves in for a couple more weeks on that, and got quite a bit of value on it. Um, calves did great on it. Really, really excited to do some more of that. So, You know, another thing and what Doug brought up, and we'll get into it later too, is the neat thing about grazing covers, I mean, I, I usually figure a, a cow will take in 20%. We're always going to leave part of our residue. We're going to leave a third of our residue. That's carbon, that's protection for the ground. We're never going to graze it in the ground. We've got to leave 10%, but you guys, there's snow here. So they, Casey, what, you probably kept the calves out of the feedlot for another two, three weeks? At least, yeah, yeah. probably a yep. It was a long time. And then just touch once on, on grazing younger cattle, how they, how they adapt where the older cattle. Right, yeah, so these calves, well, we went to a, a fence line weaning system last year, 2015 was the first year we did it. And those calves, they just seemed to take off by themselves. I mean, they did. They're out there on that grass. They're, they're doing what they're supposed to do rather than being, than being in the lot. And now we're calving out there, well, this would be the second group of heifers that we calved out. And those cows, they spend more time out grazing on all the fields and everything when we get them up to the place than anything we've ever had. They'll, they'll go after that stuff. You can pull your tractor wagon out, but that's where they want to be is out grazing, I feel attributes to the, to the fence line weaning and then get them out early on the public balance too. You know, this Toby Stolte's from, and you know, it, it takes a while to click, especially for me, because I'm, I'm old, I'm gray haired, I listen to it, I don't believe it. I don't believe it, don't believe it. The fourth time I say, well, you know, there is something here, but you know, all you're doing is cycling your residue faster. And you, but you want to leave that third, but you want to cycle that residue faster to make it available for next year's crop. I'm going to talk some on carbon because carbon is a tremendously important thing to this whole system. We have to harvest carbon. We have to harvest carbon. <clears throat> and what do you, how you do that is you do it through plant management. Carbon is a key ingredient to organic matter. Everybody talks about organic matter. Carbon is 57%. Organic matter is 57% carbon. So the only way we're going to harvest carbon is we're going to have things growing that are green. We're going to take in the carbon from the air. So, and I, I think that there's just not enough emphasis put on this because with us, we've got a full system approach where our covers are harvesting carbon. We don't want to, we, we, we want to leave our residue. So it's a, it's a kind of a holistic reproach. You know, this is a nation that destroys its soil, destroys itself. So this is the way we were. This is the way we were. And, but now I don't know, so what's that grandpa telling his grandson? He said, I made a mistake. It took me about 10, 15 years of mining the organic matter, but I made a mistake. It's up to you to fix it. It's up to you to fix it. And this is the best way we can do it with covers. I'm not saying only farming, but as long as we think about the carbon, it's, it's just a win-win. This is what we've done in our place, not going to spend a lot of time. This is grass, uh, soil sampled. It would have been grass put in after the 30s, and so that's kind of what we've done. 
on our place, benefits of organic matter, water holding capacity is a huge one. Uh, and then the, uh, the I just, uh, you just can't emphasize what uh, organic matter will do with what a percent of organic matter will do. <laughs> We've got to start <laughs> a great deal of carbon once stored in the soil, now stored in the atmosphere. We need to retain this back into the soil as humus. We just have to do that. So I'm not talking about building organic matter, I'm talking about building soils. On our, our full season cover, this is a shovel full of, of soil. Casey's holding the shovel. But so what we're building soil, so it's residue, humus, good job, Casey. Organic matter, topsoil. So, you know, and I never, you know how things kind of slow, I'm, I'm slow. But I hang around during Dwayne Beck, we went to Montana for a week, great week. Geez, just unreal. But one thing he said, he said, when, have you guys ever noticed when you walk along down in, in, the, in town and all of a sudden the sidewalk's down and, the, and you say, boy, that sidewalk sunk. That sidewalk didn't sink. The organic matter is building soil. So you're building soil. So when you walk out in our fields, even the ones that, we, the, that are, are grazed all the time with your, with the, if you manage it right, it's just like walking on a really nice shag carpet. You can feel that cush. Well, what you're doing right now is you're building humus, you're building organic matter. It's just a win-win situation. You've got to feed these. Doug talked on that. You've got to feed these. It, so this is a mistake. In 2006, we planted our first field of cover crop. Everything went 2007, it rained, and boy, that's a nice field. But you know where the mistake was made? We didn't pay any attention to the carbon. I went in there with a very low carbon, no carbon. So all of a sudden, I was paying, it took me about three years after that to make up for that. For, so now, anytime we talk about cover crop, we want, we want the carbon to nitrogen ratio to be up there. Carbon. You know, and then, so these are just uh, three different mixes. I will get back to Casey. Someone said Casey and I are going to talk, and he said, yeah, I feel sorry for Casey. <laughs> so cover crop and carbon and nitrogen, this came from Ray Ward, and this all makes sense. The one thing, you guys, and this is where the NRCS has got to help, help, and they will. When you start talking about a, 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 a cover crop with a carbon to nitrogen ratio, what you want, I want a 24 to 30. A lot of people say, well, why are you even talking about that on cover crop? I think you have to talk about that on cover crop. But we have to find out what plants, because if you get into the middle of August, towards the end of August, you can't plant a, it, it's hard to get a high carbon. It's hard to, like a, a, a forage sorghum, it's too late in the year. So yet, like an oats is a good one, but oats will get mature. So you have to understand how late you can go in this season with still your carbon to nitrogen ratio. So this is where we want to be. I want to be like right up in here, 26 to 1, because our soils are active enough, I want to slow things down. I want to slow things down. When I did it the other time, I was right down in here, and we just speed up. These are kids from Gettysburg FFA. Right on. <coughs> the one's the teacher. He just looks like a kid. Oh, the one's the teacher. Would the, would the teacher want to raise your hand? Okay. You guys, find a, find a chair. There's chairs around. You know, these are two good books, you guys. And I really, especially this one, any question you've got on how much carbon, what you're going to do, you can download this. It's a PDF. You can download that off the internet. It's, it's just a really good book. Okay, Casey. So. <coughs> so this is, it's not, we do not have all of this, but we run them, this is kind of the chunk of pasture we have. Um, most of it, you know, will never ever be farmed because it looks a lot like that. It's pretty rough country. Thank goodness. <laughs> right, right. But no, back to the, the rotational stuff. Um, when I got back, it was, well, I think we should probably move them. Well, we don't really have a lot of help around, so let's just open the gate. They'll move themselves. Well, after a couple weeks of that, you got them turned in on everything you have. So 
what we've done is we've started cross fencing. Um, we're nowhere like Doug is, but that's kind of the, the end goal is to try to break everything up. It's going to be a lot easier because Corey and I run all the cows for us to handle them in smaller pastures like that. Uh, Water is going to present a challenge, but we're working on that. And that's kind of then bringing them home, Casey. Yep, and then this is where we bring them home to. We'll just trail them across country, bring them home. This is where we run on home. Now, back to when I got home again, when we, we started growing cover crops in 2007, uh, we just turned them on. Everything that we had around there, except for a little bit of fuel, we test that out. Well, so they go and they eat the green stuff first, and then, you know, they're, they're taking too much. So now we're starting to cross-fence that, let them have certain things, and then we're controlling how much carbon how much we're leaving. We're taking two thirds, leaving a third. And that's our goal. We're seeing a lot more benefit from that rather than just turning them out, letting them graze, letting them pick and choose, so. You know, what's new for 2016? And uh, Casey, I'll let you touch on this. This is the heifer, I can't quite see the top, but it's the heifers. Yep, so our, our first calf heifers, we bring them home and they'll run. This was a full season right out back. And then it's kind of a, I don't know, basically a 30 acre lot is what it is. So they'll graze this down and, and we don't control this. <coughs> this is where we feed and everything. And then this is where they run. But there's also a quarter out to the west of here that was planted. It was, uh, we went to back to cover crop, they grazed on that. And then to the north of where the, this is, this is some corn stalks and they've also ran on that. Now, everything got covered up. The gate stayed open for them because they didn't, they, once they got through all this, it, we got covered up with snow. Now that we've melted off, they've headed right back out to that cover and they're, they're digging through it and, and hammering away on that again. So really, really like grazing the cover stuff there. You know, this is something that I did. So I talk about carbon, talk about carbon. Look at this cover crop mix. There's no carbon. What I like is this price here. Turnips, I'm, uh, you know, I, I think that we're going to go to a podge of turnip because the purple top it grows, but I mean the cattle will kick it out easy and a podge will get more of a tuber on it and more of a leaf, more of a grazer. I love flax or mycorrhizae, the 4-H peas, I don't know if I'll do that again. It's just because of the, we have, uh, we have uh, pulse crops in our rotation, I don't know if I'll do that again. But the reason I did this is this is 70, 80 bushel stripper headed, shell boring stripper headed winter wheat stubble. So we had all kinds of carbon. We had all kinds of carbon from that old straw. So all I was trying to do is put some low carbon. And another thing, when that first flush of, of, of volunteer wheat came, when I wanted to be able to take it out with clethodum. So you just take the grass out and you leave everything else alone. This is what it was. The forage peas had a great year. My big worry was, is what was going to happen now because where the cattle eat this, and Casey, I'll let you do this. And, and they sure did. We had it fenced out, and they went out there. And there was a, a rye field that we planted that we're going to go into our full season cover with this year, next to this, and they just they hit both of them well, but they really camped out on this and moved them along through that before we got to our full season. This is the calves. Okay, uh, down there we're where we take our calves to and start backgrounding them. We had a, a 111 acres to this. This is kind of our feedlot area here. It's more behind that picture, but this was a five-way mix that was planted and our goal was to get out on it, but we thought we had more time than what we did and the snow hit and we didn't, just didn't get it done. So it's a goal to, to be able to, at, at least for the calves that we're keeping for our replacements to keep them grazing on that as long as we can. You know, and another thing, and Casey already said this, but our cattle really under, are, are I'm, I'm the cow, no, but their, their cattle really understand electric fences. I mean, they respect them, they really understand them. And the, and the, the kids can move a, a, a fence in a hurry. So in 2016, we're gonna have a full season graze. This sounds really good on paper, and it was it will work on paper, but so we're going to have a full season graze. So this is our mix, and there's a reason for everything in here. What I was trying to do, see the carbon to nitrogen ratio was 32 to 1. That was real important to me. The buckwheat, you know, a lot of people, if you got buckwheat, if you have 
wheat next. You got to have a, a two years off wheat, otherwise it'll, the wheat can be rejected if there's buckwheat in the, in the export. I don't know. Probably I like what it did. It enhances phosphorus. The okra is going to go away. The and then and then the turnips is going to be a uh, be a, a podge of turnip. Kale, I love kale. A, a half a pound of kale goes a long ways. It get it'll stay green until November. It gets tall, and then but you'll see all these. At the, the mycorrhizae association, and I think that's really important. And I'm not saying we're ever going to have it to where we cut out phosphorus altogether, but it's really what that'll do is it'll actually go out and it'll it'll go it'll it'll trade carbon and it'll go and it'll it'll trade it for organic phosphorus. But look at here the mycorrhizae. So look at the the root system. 700 times more root system on a mycorrhizae plant. And I just think this is something we just have to keep, keep in the back of your mind. I mean, the, you guys, and I hope there's no seed dealers in here, but if they do, I hope you learn from what I say, is don't ever be satisfied with the guy goes in and say, this is what you need to plant. You research it and you be able to, you know enough what's going on where you're telling him what you want. This is a, we plant our, in test stubble, we, we took a cut and a teff off, and then we always leave the second cut and come back. And so uh, the cattle grazed this. There's about a foot of snow, so there's a foot of stubble left. I mean, they weren't on it very long. Our cover crop mix, everything goes together. July 10th, we're going to get rid of the okra. I like this. The, it's, it kind of scares you when you look at the plant. It's a shorter, it's a shorter brown midrib, but I like brown midrib because of the prussic acid. It takes some of that thread away of prussic acid. This is our field layout. And I wanted to find out, so there's a three-way mix, known in, and then the rest of this we put on, we had uh, 40 units of, of uh, we, we had about 80 units of in on this. And a lot of people said, you know, it's, it, you shouldn't have to put fertilizer on covers. And so we just wanted to see, so this is a full season graze, July 29th, there's our, our, our non-end uh, strips. There's our biomass, the 14th. So we did a, Jason Miller came up and August 14th we did a biomass. And then this is kind of what bothered me a little bit because within there's 7,100 pounds of biomass and without in there's 7,600 pounds of biomass. But you know, you stop and think about it, the, without the end, the other uh, the the undergrowth like the forage peas and the and the cow peas and everything they had more chance to grow because they didn't have the competition for sunlight. So you know I thought, well, did we waste our end? Second biomass, uh, 11th, 28th. So I really recommend everybody you do a biomass if nothing else just to find out where you're at. So we just took a yard square, went out, but you can see. On our 12-way within, look at the difference there. That went away, but look at here. So 25 to 1, I said I wanted to be 26, 27, but I was still happy. 11% crude, crude protein. But this is something that we've got to get answered, and I don't know how we're going to answer this. Right down here, we had 8,200 pounds of biomass, so that's 960 pounds of protein, or 144 pounds of in. So how are we going to get that back to next year's crop? Someone said, don't worry about it. But if you're, if you're talking financially, you have to be thinking about it. So what we're doing is we're grazing it. So you graze the top two thirds, you leave the bottom third, that cycles through the cattle. And so it should be more available. We still, Jason's, we're going to work on this quite a bit next summer. We're trying to get an answer to this on our farm. So here's our, uh, here's our, this Ray Ward. And one thing I like about sending down there, and I know there's a lot of good labs, but he'll actually give you a carbon to nitrogen ratio. So I mean, it just, uh, I, we felt really good about our mix. So here we go. So we had a, a yield biomass, uh, we're gonna graze pounds, it had 80, 840,000 pounds, 650, 26 pounds a day if the temperature's right. So we had 46 pounds of graze, and that sounds easy. That's a slam dunk. So we had $147, that's charge yourselves, we ran $147 into the cover crop mix. So we're gonna, 
We're, it's going to cost 75 cents a day, 11% protein, and here we go. I mean, we, it's a slam dunk. Dollar 65 to, at 20 degrees to feed through the wagon. So that's $172 an acre. So let's just write that down because we've already made that. I mean, that's that, that we, you know. <laughs> so I figured on 70 bushel spring wheat, which that field would have gone to at 475, we would have netted $76 an acre. So, you know, we're kind of making headway, plus we left the manure on the field. There's a lot of benefit of what happened on the field. Casey. Then we got into the winter and Mother Nature had a different plan for us. Uh, we started out, well, I mean, hindsight's 2020. If we could have went back and brought them home from the river sooner and, and got on this quicker and, and we, you know, we would have had all of that. But it started snowing and, and between the snow and the deer, the deer itself, it took away one of the paddocks for us, but it just, we didn't get everything out of it that we thought. Plus, it was cold, so they were eating a lot more than what we kind of anticipated to. This is a picture of after seven days of grazing one of the paddocks. Now, you'd say, well, you didn't leave a third there. Well, that snow's a couple feet deep, too. There's a lot left underneath. <laughs> there, so. But the cattle, I was happy with them. Um, once we got them up there, there was some that never, ever left it. I mean, it, it got, it's just out in the open on the flat. There's not a lot of protection. And they dug through it and got the goodie out of it. So I was very happy with that part of it. You want? You know, so we've got another one, so we've got to make sense of this. We have to make sense of this. So just like right now, so you increase your feed as the temperature drops. So this is 24 degrees. We, we figured it was going to take 23, just about 24 pounds a day. Okay, so now all of a sudden, we, we were, our average temperature with, with the wind chill was minus 3 while we were on that. So you take that, so it take 31 pounds a day. Did they really need it? We're not going to let our cattle go backwards. Our cattle didn't go backwards, right, right Casey? So, so this is our average. We had average temperature, average wind speed, wind chill. But look at our max wind speed. You know, so I mean, it was a, it was just a tough winter, you guys. Tough winter. But another thing, 36 inches of snow, and everybody knows at Christmas what a three quarters inch of rain will do. And uh, so we were still grazing this, so we had to keep working at it. Yeah, so, and we might have created a few monsters that by starting to feed, but like you said, we didn't want to let our cows slip. Like I said earlier, some of them cows never ever left to come back into the feed. But we were putting out, through the wagon, we were putting out a little silage, some hay, and then we feed peas as our protein, just, just so they were getting enough to eat everywhere. Um, and then, yeah, so it says loss of $35 per acre is kind of what we figured. But, but there again, I mean, you got to look at it as you're kind of doing this for the future, too. So what is it going to do this year for our crop? A few, a few things like that. It's hard to put a value on some of that stuff. Go ahead, Casey. Yeah, we, we fed a lot of deer. <laughs> if I were to do it over, I wouldn't recommend the deer or the snow, but we had them. Uh, my dad left his ranger in the tracks so because he didn't figure he needed them in Arizona, so we used that. Otherwise, we probably would have wore out a set of snowshoes and been in a lot better shape. But they tore down our fence pretty much every day. Um, the cows stayed pretty good. They didn't. They still didn't like to step across it, even though it was on the ground. We battled it a little bit. But these deer, they'd sit there. We started on started on the east end. Gave them gave them that chunk or there was five chunks, and then we just worked our way, started on the west end, worked our way east. And these deer, you'd go out there to move fence, and they just kind of hang, they'd move off a little bit, and then they just stayed on the stuff that the cows weren't on until we got to the to the end of it. I mean, they they had the, the goody taken out of it. So we definitely lost part of it to that. Um, the whole north side was, it was tough for the cows to even get there. I mean, it was, it blew in, and I mean, it was chest deep on me. So, but after after it settled a little bit, those cows did go in there, and they grazed what they could out of it. So. You know, Casey, then another thing, too, with this is, 
your size of paddocks, were you all right with it, or would you do it different, or what are you no, thinking? I, I like how we did it. <coughs> it gave everything enough space to get around and everything. Um, with that number of cows on there, I thought I thought it worked out real well. So. Okay. And then we did do a bale graze this year for the first time, so this it's about 63 acres that it's kind of between the windbreak and the feed yard and the water and everything, so it stays open to the cows every year. So it just got abused. I mean, every year it just got abused. Well, what we did is we planted it back to grass. We took our first cutting of hay off of it this year. We took the bales off, and then we decided, well, let's let's go ahead and bale graze it. So we took the where I took all the bales back out, <laughs> and we had net wrap on them, but I yeah. uh, I got to run the loader and Corey cut all the net wrap <laughs> off, put them on end. So it worked very very well. Um, you can see how deep the snow is. I I was worried about them getting out and around in there, but. And then just like Doug said, today I was across that and there's a layer of ice underneath there that's at least a foot deep and a thin layer of hay on it. And this year we'll probably rest it. Um, our bulls get a little anxious, they're right along the Highway 83, so get close to breeding time, they like to venture out on their own. So we're going to bring them up and graze this with them just kind of as a, just to clip it for, I don't know, two, three weeks. And then that'll rest to it for the end of the year and then we'll decide whether we want to bale graze it again this year or we're going to rest it another year. This is just kind of a layout. Uh, so this is the farm here. Um, this is where we bale grazed here. This is our feed yard here. This was corn stalks. Um, this is winter wheat, so this will go back to a, to a grazing cover. This is going to be our full season and this will be the wheat. So just kind of a layout. The, thing that I've learned the most with, since I've gotten back, even on the grass pastures, is, is if you have a plan going into something, you're a lot more likely to do it rather than just saying, well, maybe I should do this. If you if you set yourself up with some some sort of a plan, and, and you can go deviate from that or whatever, but have some type of plan in place. I mean, it's worked a lot for us because it's so easy to say, well, yeah, let's go ahead and move them cows today or whatever. If you have, if you know what direction you want to go with it, it'll, it's a lot easier to stick to. You know, another thing I want to compliment Casey and Corey on, because they came up with the plan. Before our cows had come home and it was just wherever they wanted to go, and they actually had it where they had a fence here. They ran the corn stalks for a while. We kept them off of here because this is winter wheat. Uh, and But, uh, excuse me, it is not. This is winter wheat down here. But anyway, so this is a full season graze, but everything they had a plan on how they were going to raise them. You know, so, and, and like you say, this is planted back to rye. Uh, I like rye, but so this is corn stalks and the, and the heifers ran, they came through the fence, they ran here and they ran here. So what we'll do after corn stalks is we want to keep our carbon up. We we're big believers in carbon. So what we'll do is we'll come back with oats. We love oats. We love oats, so oats will come back, and then and then uh, we'll actually uh, and come back with the cover after our oats. So our heifers next year, full season graze, which that's just the way it works. And then here, and then this will be corn stalks so that run on. And then another thing, this is a this is a slough area, or what we call it, it's where they feed, fed for a lot of years. And what we do now is we we put a full season cover in there. One thing too, you guys, on a full season cover, when you do a biomass, we did a biomass on this and we sent it in and you clip it at the ground so all of a sudden you say, where are you, where are you on nitrates? That's something you've got to be very concerned about. Don't ask your neighbor if this is safe to graze. Find out. Find out a nitrate test. And so what we were, like, we were just, when, when clipped all the way to the ground, we were right at 1,400 parts per million. So that didn't really concern us because we knew we were only going to let them have uh, two-thirds. And then Casey, uh, as far as, will they ever go back to the old paddock? Once they oh. graze a the paddock and they move it, will they go back? They do. I mean, that's kind of a good telltale to when you need to, when you need to move them to is if they do come back to another one. But no, every time we moved it, they seemed to go after the new stuff. Now, after we were all done, we knew we had so much under the snow that we let them have it for whole thing for another week and they pretty much evenly spanned out over the whole thing and but they they love it up there I mean that's that's where they wanted to be so. this is just a picture this is going to be next year's cover 
So we cut silage and, and our kind of our goal, I don't know if we'll get away from it right, Casey, is to maybe eliminate silage, but I don't know if we will or not, but we really like to plant rye back on. We're in winter wheat country, but we really manage our rye. We don't let our rye get very big, but it's unbelievable the, what the root structure will be from rye. You know, and, and Doug talked a lot about Canada and uh, the round, you know, and so we say we can't do this, and, but they're doing it. But one thing I think, and this is what we need to do. I mean, I'm not saying any of these, but this is what we need to do. They've got a, they've got a, a number for their nutrient cycling. And we need to do that. As a farm, we need to do that. And we will find that out. Some guys say, well, what difference to make? Take half, take half. I think we really need to, to understand what's going on. You can tell your soil's healthy by looking. It, it has great texture. It crumbles like moist chocolate cake. It'll have a smell as a freshly dug potato. So if you guys ever come to our farm, the first thing we're gonna do is we'll get some soil. I'm not gonna call it dirt, I'm gonna call it soil. I'm gonna ask you to smell it. Because it will smell. If you've got healthy soil, your soil will tell you. Our farm and ranch feels we should do everything we can to make this a better world. We, not, we do not ask ourselves why we know the answer and a picture is worth a thousand words. We've got a little clip here of, of uh, the time lapse uh, that we're gonna show and it was kind of neat. The NRCS, they, they put a camera out when the cover crop was this tall and it's still out there right now. But they're gonna, uh, Josh is gonna, this is uh, in the middle of the, like the third week in November, so you can kind of see what we're up against. But you can see on a normal year where we would have had a pretty good graze. Even there we could handle. Why didn't you just get a deer in the picture? We do. <laughs> Randy Helverson, uh, who was a contract with the NRCS, and, and, and uh, there are it on Dakota Lakes, the cameras are still there, and the camera's still out there, so it's gonna be, but you can see here, now we're getting to the end. I mean, this, the cows are out here grazing right now, and you'll be able to see the deer, right? See, there's some deer. <laughs> but now this, so you think, well, that's about enough snow. <laughs> So you can see what we were up against. I mean, so I feel really good about what happened because, I, don't you, Casey? Yeah, we still save a ton of feed by, by doing all of this and what we did for the soils itself. Is, is, this, a, is this a one year out of 10? It probably is. That's just like saying, is it gonna be dry next year? Well, I'm not gonna go plant my corn very heavy because it's gonna be dry. So we're gonna go ahead with things and we're gonna take the average, so.